All right, turn with me to Luke, the seventh chapter. Luke chapter 7. <coughs> reading in verse 1, Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Now when he, Jesus, concluded all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. And a certain centurion's servant who was dear to him was sick and ready to die. So when he heard about Jesus, he sent elders of the Jews to him, pleading with him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they begged him earnestly, saying that the one for whom he should do this was deserving. For he loves our nation and has built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them. And when he was already not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Therefore I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Jesus heard these things, he marveled at it, and turned around and said to the crowd that followed, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And those who were sent, returning to the house, found the servant well, who had been sick. This is a, an interesting account. It's, it's, it's something to think about, the fact that this is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus reacted in this way someone's faith um, and this was not a priest and it was not a, a, a scribe and it wasn't a, a, a Pharisee and as a matter of fact it wasn't even a Jew at all it was a, it was a centurion a Roman soldier uh, someone who was in who was in Palestine to uh, su subjugate the, the Jewish people and yet this is someone who uh, Jesus marveled at him marveled at his faith that's what we want to talk about for a little while tonight, the centurion's faith. What was it that caused Jesus to marvel? The centurion was um, a man with, with great authority. He would have, a, a centurion was one who would have been in charge of a of hundred uh, Roman soldiers. I was reading up on that a little bit. It, was, it would have been about 80 soldiers and probably about 20 servants of various kinds that would have served different functions for that, that unit of soldiers, he was a man uh, with great authority, and it was his his servant. It was that was that was sick. We see as we as we read um, this, this passage that the the centurion was someone who cared about others. He had this servant who was uh, sick and, and at the point of death, uh, and he was concerned enough that he sent uh, to have. Jesus come and, and, and heal him. Um, we also see that when the, the Jewish uh, elders that he sent to, to get Jesus, that he was someone who, who cared about the Jewish people. He cared uh, so much, in fact, that he helped build their, their synagogue for him. He was uh, supportive of, of God's people and, and, and God's work. Uh, and, and yet, uh, even, even with that being the case, he would not have been uh, someone who would have been as knowledgeable about Old Testament scriptures as, as those Jewish elders and the Jews in general would have been and, and, and yet we see that he's the one who recognized Jesus for who he was or the power that he had uh, he had this this remarkable reputation uh, it, it's remarkable because it was not the common thing for, for Roman centurions, the Roman soldiers to to, you know, to love and, and support the Jewish people. Uh, and, and it was also not something that would have been common for the, these Jewish elders to be uh, pleading with Jesus on behalf of, of one of these uh, a Roman centurion. Uh, because they're, uh, as I said, you know, that, what was he there for? He was there to subjugate the Jewish people. And we see also that he, he, uh, he demonstrated genuine humility. When the, Jesus got close to his house, uh, he had sent the elders to call for Jesus. And Jesus was going to come. And when he got close to his house, he sent friends out to talk to Jesus and say, you know, I'm not worthy for you to come uh, under my roof. Um, 
being with someone with, with authority such as that, you know, I think we've all known those kind of people. You give them a little bit of authority and they start to think they're somebody and might be just a little bit better than you are. But uh, he was not like that. He was someone who, who demonstrated genuine humility. Uh, we, as we consider his, uh, his nature and, and the faith that he had, we see that, that he saw his need. He knew that he had a, a need that, that he couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't remedy it without the Lord's help. Uh, chapter 7 and verse 2, uh, his, uh, his servant was, was dear to him and was sick and ready to die. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 6, which is the, the parallel account of this particular instance, uh, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. That's from the English Standard Version. There was nothing he could do about it. This, this servant was in a position, uh, he, he, he loved this servant, and uh, there was nothing he could do. He couldn't help his servant, but he wanted to do something, and so uh, he, he cared enough to, to send Jesus. He was honest about his, his powerlessness and his need for help there in verse 7. Therefore, I did not even think uh, myself worthy to come to you, but say the word, and my servant will be healed. He, he understood Jesus' power and he trusted enough to seek help from the only one that he believed could help. And that was, was Jesus. Jesus, uh, his reputation uh, preceded him. Uh, you think about the work that Jesus did. You think about the reception that he got from, from uh, the Jewish people at that time. And, it, and it's a wonder uh, that they didn't respond to the wonders they were. He, they, you know, many did. He had disciples, and, and we see the day of Pentecost, and when, you know, it was 3,000 that day that, that uh, gladly received the word and were baptized. But by and large, the Jewish people, uh, in, in spite of the fact that Jesus' miracles were not worked in a, in a corner somewhere, they were well known. And yet, so many rejected that uh, and yet this this Roman centurion trusted Jesus enough as he knew who his, his reputation he believed and knew that Jesus was the one who could help him and then the question comes to us do we do we see our need uh, we have a need that cannot be remedied without the Lord uh, we are all guilty of sin Romans chapter 3 verse 23 we are all, let me turn over there because I don't have verse 24 memorized. <coughs> Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. Remember that Paul has, in these first three chapters, he's convicted both Jew and Gentile of their sin. And he, he, he's, he's coming to the conclusion of this section. He says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There is the need because we are sinners and the wages of sin is death and yet there is nothing we can do about it to take that sin away on our own. There's nothing. Once you sin, Romans chapter 7, Paul uh, very eloquently describes the helplessness and hopelessness that one feels when you live under that law and the only way to be just under that law is, is sinlessness. You recognize that you're a sinner and what are you going to do? What are you going to do to take it away? Blood, wolves, and goats is not sufficient, Hebrews chapter 10 tells us. But Jesus died for us. We're justified freely by His great grace, uh, Romans 3, 24. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is through the grace of God that we are able to be saved. Do we care enough to do something about it? This centurion obviously did. His need uh, was such that he, and he recognized Jesus' ability to do something about it, and he cared enough to actually do something. Do we care enough? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall man give in return for his soul? There are so many distractions in this life, and, and it is uh, so easy uh, 
to get tied up and to forget why we're here. You know, we can we can push uh, the, push that grave out of our mind long enough to get by day to day, and, and a lot of people do that, and, and to the point where they. I don't know if they don't forget about it, but it's like you accept it's, it's inevitability and, and just, um, you, you just take that, the idea of, of, of dying and, and what's after it and, and completely forget about it. Just and, and are not concerned enough about that to do something about it. Do we care enough to do anything? Are we honest? Are we honest? This, this centurion, he recognized that even though he had authority, there, this was something he couldn't do anything about. We need to recognize that sin is something we can't uh, wash away our own sins. We have to have the grace of God and what Jesus did for us. Are we honest about that? Uh, Matthew chapter 13, uh, verses 18 through 23. Look over there real quick. We read that this morning. We'll read it again. It won't hurt us. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 18, the parable of the sower being explained. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because the word immediately stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Um, we need to honestly recognize uh, where we fall uh, in this parable. What kind of soil is our heart? We need to be honest. This, this centurion was. We need to be as well. Do we trust the Lord enough to seek salvation from our sin by submitting to His way? And that's kind of the big deal, isn't it? You know, it's one thing to, to recognize you're a sinner and understand you need to do something about it, but it's another thing entirely to recognize that that what has to be done is a <coughs> submission. We have to put Jesus's will ahead of our own. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 tells us that though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And it becomes our obligation to obey him. Will we, as Mark chapter 16, verse 16 says, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. It is not enough for us to merely assent to, to Jesus as the Son of God. It takes uh, obedience. Acts 2.38 Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then those that gladly received the word that day were baptized. 3,000 souls were added. Why did they do that? Because they trusted. And we have to trust in the Lord. Believe and trust to the point that we are willing to be obedient. We see also the centurion's humility. Flip back over there to Luke chapter 7, verse 2. Uh, he had that servant who, who was uh, sick and ready to die. He, he recognized that, that he was undeserving. Uh, and, and he appealed to those, the, those Jewish leaders to, to mediate on his behalf. It takes humility to do that. This guy was a guy that the, the Romans ruled things. They were the ones in charge. And he could have easily uh, tried to force Jesus. That's not how he went about it. He appealed to the Jewish elders to mediate on his behalf. Uh, he sent messengers to prevent Jesus from coming to his home. He didn't think he was worthy of having Jesus come to his home. He knew Jesus' reputation. And, and he didn't think he was worthy. He understood the nature of the Lord's authority. Jesus had authority. He, he himself was a man of authority, but he recognized Jesus' greater authority. He, this was a man who, though he was in a position of power, he was humble. And the question then is, are we humble? What kind of humility uh, do we evidence? Do we realize how undeserving 
We are. Job 42. Job 42. Verses 5 and 6. You remember, um, God questioned Job and kind of put him in his place a little bit there. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, Job said, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job recognized where he stood in relation to God. Do we recognize how undeserving we are? You know, it is absolutely not because we are worthy that God sent Jesus to die for us. While we were yet sinners, Romans chapter 5 tells us, God sent his son to die for us. Psalm 16 and verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. I have no good apart from you. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 5. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, these, these people who have had these, these encounters with God, and they have this very keen sense of, of the superiority of God and where we as human beings fit uh, within that that order of things. Um, Luke chapter 17 and verse 10. Jesus is talking about um, you know, a servant. When, when you are a servant and you have done everything that you are commanded to do, you haven't done anything. All you have done is what was your duty to do. And you know, the accusation is made a lot of times about members of the church that because we teach the necessity of obedience and, and the fact that God saves those who are obedient. I mean, we talked about Matthew 7, 21 this morning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. When we teach that, it somehow becomes uh, a, a charge leveled against us that we think that somehow we, we are worthy of, of what it is that God has done for us. It's not the case at all. It's simply a recognition that we have to be obedient. But we are we are undeserving. We need to recognize that. First Peter chapter five and verse five. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We need to recognize that. No one deserves salvation. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever sort of believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. It is, it is uh, because of God's great love for us that we are able to be saved. It is not something that we have earned or, or merited in any way, shape, or form. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28 This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of of sins. It took Jesus' blood for us to be forgiven. And it is only through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way we're going to go to heaven. If God hadn't sent Jesus, where would we be? What hope would we have? We'd have none. Humility is absolutely essential if we're going to be saved because we need to recognize our need poor in spirit. Those are the ones who are going to be blessed in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. That's what Jesus said. Humility is essential. Turn with me to James 4 chapter. <coughs> James chapter 4 verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore he says... God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. We have to humble ourselves. We must humble ourselves to the point that we recognize the authority of Jesus. Jesus said it's those that lose their lives that are going to find it. Well, what does it mean to lose your life? I mean, Jesus didn't say that the only way we're going to find life is if we're somehow martyred for his cause. That's not what he's talking about. The ones that lose their lives so that they can find life are those who are willing to submit to his authority. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say in chapter 6 and verse 46? So many. They call Jesus Lord, but in, in, in practical terms, what does it really mean for their day-to-day -day living? What does it mean for their existence day-to-day? -day? Does it change you know, what they do, how they act, who they are? If it doesn't, we're doing it wrong. And Jesus knows that. And he points out with that rhetorical question in Luke 6, 46, the pointlessness of calling him Lord, Lord, when you don't really submit to him as Lord. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul said, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He goes on there to explain what it means to call on the name of the Lord. It means to be obedient to the gospel call. But whoever calls on the name of the Lord, we have to submit and call on the name of the Lord if we expect to be saved. Are we humble like that centurion was? And then we see his faith. We see his faith turn back over there to Luke chapter 7. When Jesus heard these things, how he, he viewed himself as, as being uh, unworthy. I did not even think myself worthy to come to you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. He viewed himself as being unworthy. He, he absolutely trusted Jesus' authority. Say the word and my servant uh, will be healed. He recognized how things worked but based upon the authority that he had with his with his you know his soldiers and servants. You know, I say and, and I ask, I tell him to jump and they ask how high and he recognized Jesus had more authority than that. You just say the word and my servant will be healed. And then we see that Jesus marveled. Jesus marveled, verse nine. When he heard these things, he marveled at him. And, and the, the, the Greek word there, uh, marveled, it can also be translated, he was amazed. He was amazed at the faith that this centurion exhibited. He turned around and said to the crowd that followed him, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Jesus was amazed at his faith. Well, what about our faith? What about our faith? Does he see our desperate hunger for his provision? We need to hunger and thirst for righteousness so that we might be filled again back to the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. <coughs> Does Jesus see that in us? Does it show in our lives? Does he see our attitude of hopelessness without him? Do we understand? Do we truly understand that? And do we latch on to the hope that has been provided for us? Does he see our humility? Again, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Does he see our complete submission to his authority? And, and all that we do, Colossians 3, verse 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Does he see that? Is that what we seek to do? Not only uh, in, in the church, when it comes to the, the, the work and worship of the church, but also in our day-to-day -day life. Do we seek that authority? Do we have that complete trust in his word? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, we are to walk by faith and not by sight. And what does that mean? We walk according to the precepts of God's word. We walk according to the promises found in God's word. That the, the context there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is talking about the resurrection, the fact that we're going to receive a, a, a new body. We're going to be raised from the dead. Do we live our lives as if we're going to be raised from the dead? Because we are. That's that complete trust.
complete trust is that we we don't walk according to the things we can see. Because if all we did was walk according to the things we could see, we would be like 1 Corinthians chapter 15, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, because what do we see? With just our eyes. We see that people grow old and they die. People die in accidents. People die. Do we completely trust his word? Do we live our lives offering our bodies as living sacrifices? In Romans chapter 12 teaches us. Is our faith more like the centurion's faith or is it more like the citizens of Nazareth? You know that we talked about that Greek word that Jesus marveled at it. He, he was amazed. That Greek word is used one other time in regard to faith and it's in regard to the lack of faith of the people of Nazareth where Jesus was from. Mark the 6th chapter beginning in verse 1. Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. Then he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come he began to teach in the synagogue and many hearing him were astonished saying where did this man get these things and what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could not do many mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about the villages in the circuit, teaching. And again, this is kind of goes back to the what we see in the centurion, this person who you wouldn't think would be the one to have this amazing faith such that Jesus would marvel at it. You would expect that maybe some of his countrymen would. That wasn't the case. And those of his own, his own country were offended at it. And he marveled at their own belief. Where, where does our faith fall along that? If, they, if there were a spectrum there, where, where would ours fall? It's something we need to think about. And that's our lesson for tonight. We need to have faith in Jesus. We need to trust Him to be able to, to cure what ails us. And it is sin which ails us. And if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, you need to do that while you have a chance. Believe that Jesus is the Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess Him before men. Be baptized water to have your sins washed away by his blood because the water is magical but because that's how God told us to contact that blood to receive the benefits of the blood that Jesus shed for us and the Lord will add you to the church it's the body of the saved and we'll have the never done that do it tonight if you're here if you're a child of God your life hasn't been what it's supposed to be does, does your faith is it like the centurions do you trust Jesus enough to change your life? Has your, has your life truly been changed? Are you living the way that you're supposed to live? Because remember in James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. Demons believe and tremble. Just knowing that there's a God, that Jesus is his son, is not going to get us through those part of the gates. You have to be obedient. If you haven't been obedient, you need to repent. We'll pray with you and for you. And God will forgive you. Whatever your need might be this evening, won't you come forward and make it not long together? We stand and sing.